Okay, everybody, hopefully you enjoyed the posters and saw all the great work that's going on at the Edwards Lab uh, nowadays and had some great conversations and hopefully shared some good memories. So my job here is to kind of entertain you with a, a public talk. And when Daniel Phillips first gave me the challenge of giving a public science lecture on the nuclear physics of the Edwards Accelerator Lab over the past 50 years, I was pretty daunted because as you've seen, there's a lot of different things that have happened, a lot of different science that's uh, ongoing. And I thought, how could you possibly explain that to, to somebody, especially if you're trying to do it in, in general? You know, to do that, you'd need like a series of introductory lessons in nuclear physics to make it work at all. And that's when I realized that that's, that's what we need to do, is to have introductory lessons in nuclear physics uh, so the people taking the nuclear physics course right now will recognize some of this. <laughs> and what I'll try to do is to, to weave in the history of the Edwards Accelerator Lab so you can see how the research done here over the past 50 years has contributed to the kind of the body of knowledge of nuclear physics. So let's go to lesson one. So this is an atomic nucleus. Uh, most of you probably know because we're nuclear physicists here, but for those that are new to this, uh, the atomic nucleus has two, two parts, right? It's the core of the atom. It has a proton and a neutron. And this is an extremely compact thing uh, hidden in, in the core of the atom. And basically all of the interactions, uh, what you're trying to figure out is how are these protons and neutrons going to interact with other protons and neutrons when they collide or when they hang out together, um, how are they going to interact with each other? That's, that's basically all that we're trying to do here. And in fact, it was seen in the early days of nuclear physics that protons and neutrons are basically kind of mirror images of each other. You can, you can treat them as this thing called the nucleon, where the proton is one state of the nucleon and the neutron is another state of the nucleon. And this is very convenient because for most purposes then, you don't really need to worry about whether you had a proton or a neutron. It's just this magical thing called the nucleon. And so then if I take a nucleus that has some number of protons and some number of neutrons, and I swap them, you get basically the same sort of nucleus. These nuclei are mirror images of each other. And this is a very powerful tool in nuclear physics that we use, that we use all the time. However, early on, it was also seen that while this nucleon picture is kind of cute, there's a bit of a crack in the mirror. This mirror symmetry between a, the proton and the neutron is not exact. When you swap the numbers of protons and neutrons, it's not only the nuclear charge that differs, but really a neutron and a proton are not exactly the same thing. And an early contribution to, to figuring out this, this issue of so-called isospin, you know, whether you have a proton or a neutron, this isospin dependence, a lot of this pioneering work was done by Jack Rappaport. So Jack and his group used a tool called neutron scattering to basically really quantify just how different is the proton and the neutron. So what you do is you take a proton beam, you scatter it off of some target, and you look at how many protons you get at different angles. You then take the same old target, you make a neutron beam, and you scatter it off the target, and you look at this angular distribution again. And this is where the Edwards lab really shines, because as you've, as you've probably seen over the past uh, day and a half, the Edwards lab is really one of the, if not the premier neutron physics lab in the, in the United States, in my very biased opinion. So we're very good at doing these sorts, of, these sorts of measurements. So basically, you take the accelerator, the big orange tank, and you do a nuclear reaction, uh, in this case on a, on a gas cell or on a target, uh, you produce neutrons in that nuclear reaction. And then you can measure how many you get at this angle, that one, and so on, and produce these beautiful angular distribution plots. Ultimately, then you do some nuclear theory voodoo that we don't want to talk about today. And you can then see just how different the proton and the neutron are. And so this is where we contributed early on in the history of the accelerator lab. Now, of course, this takes a lot more than one measurement. And there were many PhD students over the years who contributed uh, to these scattering measurements and led them to gain more and more insight into the nucleus and really study this crack in the mirror of isospin symmetry. Uh, one thing I want to point out is all the way back to the early papers from the accelerator lab, you see Don Carter's name, and he's still in the author list and acknowledgments of papers today, and that's a really remarkable achievement. And I think if I accomplish half in, you know, in my career, if I accomplish half of what he's accomplished, I'll be very satisfied 
uh, person. Now, the beauty of this neutron scattering tool is it's, it's very general. You, you don't just study isospin dependence. You can learn many, many things about a nucleus. And over the years, these various neutron scattering measurements have taught us a lot of different things from basic nuclear physics all the way to nuclear astrophysics and applications, as I'll mention. Uh, one thing that the Edwards lab helped contribute to is studying the shape of a nucleus. So when I put protons and neutrons together, they don't have to assemble in a sphere, and often they don't. Instead, they can be many different shapes. And one of the ways that you study these shapes is through neutron scattering, which again, the lab excels at. And an amazing early finding uh, from the history of the accelerator lab was that when you study the shape of a nucleus, it actually depends on how you probe it. So if you, if you try to study the shape of the nucleus, it's sensitive to the probe itself. So if you take a proton in and you scatter it, or a neutron in and you scatter it, you actually get a slightly different answer. And up until this point, it was thought there were experimental uncertainties that explained it all away. It really wasn't a problem. And then ultimately, the precision that the accelerator lab was able to provide showed that this is a real effect. So a proton coming in, it stretches the nucleus a little bit maybe, or a neutron coming in stretches it a little bit differently, and you can actually see this from these uh, neutron scattering measurements. Now neutron scattering also can tell you about the structure of a nucleus. So when I take a bunch of protons and neutrons and put them together, they can form some configuration. If you add a little bit of energy, that configuration slightly changes. And as you add more and more energy, you have lots of different configurations that these, that these nucleons can combine to, to form. And neutron scattering is an incredibly powerful probe to study the structure of nuclei. And over the years, this has been used not only to study this, this crack in the mirror, this isospin asymmetry, but also you can do precision tests of theoretical models to really see if we understand the nucleus or not. A huge contributor to this work, and really the, the powerhouse behind it, was Ray Lane and the, the Lane gang that you see down here. They really dominated these <laughs> neutron scattering measurements for many years, and you see, for instance, Ed Sadowski. These were also the first two uh, PhDs produced by um, experiments performed at the accelerator lab with that tank that is, that is now orange. Moving beyond fundamental physics, you can learn about things of, of, of interest in other fields, nuclear astrophysics. And this is an example that you probably saw Joseph's poster out there. Joseph Durkin is working on a device to help you do uh, neutron scattering, for instance, for nuclear astrophysics. So uh, Joseph you know, could explain it better than I could, and you probably heard it from him already, but you basically have this big behemoth of a neutron collimator that they're calling FAST that we're really only able to make because of the talents of the machine shop and our local engineering staff. And what Joseph and uh, Carl and company are gonna do is they're gonna be able to very precisely study the states uh, in a nucleus that in this case you know, are of interest for nuclear astrophysics and applications. So this reaction, for instance, here, where you combine a helium nucleus and a carbon-13 nucleus, this winds up being very important for element formation in the universe. Into applications, uh, neutron scattering is of course very important, and this is just one example. And I'm cheating a little bit because it's not exactly a traditional scattering measurement, but this is the iron sphere that we heard about earlier from Carl with Sushil de Kahl. And this was a, a pretty recent finding from a few years ago that was a little bit startling, <laughs> that when you produce neutrons and you let them scatter inside of a sphere of iron, the answer is actually different than what the model codes predict. And the reason that that's startling is you need these model codes to model nuclear reactors, all kinds of environments for nuclear applications. And uh, iron is a common component in nuclear applications. And so what we found out is basically for quite some time, the, the models that you're using to, to model these reactors and such in applied environments are a little bit wrong. And, that is something that you could really only find out with kind of the precision neutron work that the Edwards Accelerator Lab can do. So let's move on to lesson two. So here, it's surprising at first maybe that if you look close enough, the nucleus is a fluid. So it may sound weird because it's this very compact ball, this very compact object at the center of the atom, kind of isolated from everything else, basically floating in empty space. And 
but believe it or not, you can treat it as a fluid, so as a, as a liquid or a gas. And what this means is that we can use the same physics tools that you use to describe an internal combustion engine, you can use those same tools to, to, uh, to describe a nucleus and understand the nucleus. So specifically, this would be statistical mechanics if you wanna, if you wanna sound fancy. Um, so when you look at a nucleus from a statistical perspective, one of the things that you see is that the more energy you pump into the nucleus, the more configurations it can have. So the, the nucleus has some favored configuration called the ground state. You put a little bit of energy in, you'll eventually find there's another favorite configuration. Put some more, you'll find another configuration. And as you go up in energy, you get more and more configurations that are very similar in energy that you can make in this nucleus. It, it roughly increases exponentially. And nuclear reactions that you perform at the Edwards lab, they basically provide a magnifying glass to count these configurations and see how these nuclei really are structured and how well the statistical picture of a nucleus works. And so, uh, for instance, what we're looking at here for people in the business is Erickson fluctuations. And Roger Finley did a lot of the early work and Steve Grimes uh, led this over many years. And you can see some uh, several PhD students, Vivek Mishra, who's in the audience, uh, did this, this work to really count these configurations and figure out how exactly is a nucleus structured from a statistical perspective. You can also, with reactions at the Edwards lab, get insight into just how gas-like your nucleus is. So you're looking at work here from Fred, Fred Bateman. Again, these are uh, Erickson fluctuations. And it doesn't, the details here don't matter, but basically you're trying to figure out how many configurations you have as you pump energy into a nucleus. And if it's really truly gas-like, you should fall on the line and the data are what you see here. And I just noticed also some of this is from Vivek Mishra, so if you recognize him as well. And you really can see that a nucleus really is quite gas-like. So this kind of wild assertion that a nucleus is a fluid, uh, really, uh, you know, you can see that it's actually true. And it's the kind of thing you can only do with experiments that you can do at the Edwards lab. Another interesting fact about nuclei from this fluid perspective is that if you heat a nucleus, it actually evaporates particles. So you can, you can think of doing a nuclear reaction with a nucleus as pumping energy into it. It's heated to a high temperature, and then it boils off those nucleons. And you can imagine this then as an evaporation process. And what you're looking at, for instance, is you're, you're counting how many particles, in this case neutrons, do I have that have a given energy? And you, make, you create an energy spectrum and you can then learn something about the structure of the nucleus that you're evaporating to. You can measure the temperature of the nucleus. Now, gaining insight into nuclei, as we've already covered, requires a lot of data. And so the work I'm presenting here is, has been the work of many PhDs over the years. Um, Steve Grimes uh, really led the early work on doing these evaporation spectrum measurements. The world leader right now is in our audience is research faculty Alexander Voinov, and I'm just trying to get some of the shine off their glow by learning the technique uh, myself, but really the, the real hard work there was done by Doug Soltes. So you can see you do lots and lots and lots of these measurements, and you can start to learn something about the configuration of these nuclei, how gas-like are they, and some other details. So for instance, a somewhat recent PhD student, Anthony Ramirez, he used this tool to measure the temperature of the gas. So if you treat a nucleus as a fluid, as a gas, you can measure its temperature. And amazingly, you can, you know, you can get it very precisely with these measurements at the Edwards lab. So what you're doing in this case is you're putting your beam into a target, you're heating that nucleus, it boils off nucleons, and then you can collect, in this case, protons and alpha particles in these silicon detectors and you basically measure that energy spectrum and uh, can compare that to your calculations and you can then measure the temperature of your nucleus. And one amazing finding is that it, it's true, the nucleus has a fixed temperature. So it's not only a gas, you can treat it just like a gas, but it's a gas that's sitting there at a fixed temperature, which is kind of remarkable and not something I think you would, you would naively guess. And, and again, the Edwards lab is really been the leader in, in um, 
proving this with nuclear experiments. You can get further insight into the statistical behavior of nuclei through these evaporation spectrum measurements. And one really surprising finding from, from my student Doug from, uh, from last year is that this exponential increase in the number of configurations that you can have in a nucleus as you pump more and more energy into it actually seems to pause for some nuclei. So rather than it just continually exponentially increasing, you get, you get basically this plateau where the number of configurations that you can have does not follow the exponential increase that you, that you would expect. And at the moment, there is no nuclear theory that describes why that would be. We've seen it in a couple nuclei, and we have no idea what is causing it. So the Edwards lab you know, continues to help constrain and drive nuclear theory as we, uh, as we you know, are in the 50th year of operation. You can bring it back to kind of the beginning and get insight into isospin dependence. This was another amazing finding from the past couple of years from Alexander Voinov. You look at your nucleus boil off nucleons. So again, you heat it up. In this case, the nuclear reaction is boron 11, gets uh, absorbed by calcium 48. You watch this nucleus that you make boil off protons and neutrons. And you expect from our understanding of this isospin dependence of this, this you know, crack in the mirror, you expect some number of neutrons and some number of protons. And what Alexander and company found is that in fact you get more protons than you would predict. So there seems to be this isospin asymmetry. We don't really understand it. And it's fascinating because we use this understanding to um, do model calculations of how the elements in the universe were made. So these neutron capture reactions on very short-lived nuclei that occur in stellar explosions, we thought we understood this isospin dependence, and so we've just been using theory to calculate the rates. And Alexander and others showed that that is not correct. And so we're gonna uh, help drive nuclear theory moving into the future here to try to improve those predictions. So let's move on to the third and the, the final lesson because I don't want to uh, bore you too much. The third lesson here in introductory nuclear physics is that there's a very close relationship between nuclear astrophysics and nuclear applications. And this is something you probably noticed from Carl's talk. Now it may seem weird at first, but when you think about it more, it's not actually so strange. So the inside of a star is just a nuclear fusion reactor. Right? So if you, if you understand stars, then you, in, in a sense, you understand the process of fusion for fusion reactors. And I know I'm cheating a little bit here, that's a fission reactor, but come on, you know, cut me some slack. Um, but there's also a connection in the nuclei that are involved in these environments. So right now, we believe that you know, half the elements heavier than iron, uh, roughly half of them were made in these very exotic environments called neutron star mergers. You have two massive stars that at the end of their lives, they explode and they form these very compact objects, these neutron stars. These are objects that are roughly the size of Athens, but they are uh, as massive as the sun. These two things ultimately will spiral inwards, merge with each, merge with each other in a very violent uh, explosion. There's a brilliant flash of light called a kilonova that, that uh, faculty member, uh, former faculty member Ryan Chornock was the, one of the first to observe. And you see this brilliant glow of light afterwards. And it turns out that glow of light is powered by the radioactive decay of nuclei that are the same nuclei that you make in fission reactions, in neutron-induced fission, that are of interest for uh, nuclear reactors and a variety of nuclear applications. So there's a very close interplay between these two things. And so when you're learning more about nuclear astrophysics, you're actually really learning more about nuclear applications as well, and often vice versa. And that's something that we've, um, that we've made progress with uh, at the Edwards Lab over really the whole history, but especially in the past several years. So let's just go through a few examples. So the universe began with a bang, a, the Big Bang. Basically everything was some tiny point and then all of space rapidly expanded in this thing called the Big Bang. And for a moment in time, not very long, it was extremely hot and extremely dense. And that is when the first uh, elements were made around 14 billion years ago. So that's when you had uh, your protons and uh, the protons and neutrons were sort of created. And then in the Big Bang, the protons and neutrons combined to form the light elements. 
And this Big Bang is interesting not only because of the light elements that it made, um, but also because you can, you can basically look at the nucleosynthesis signatures, so what you actually made early in the universe, and then use that to constrain the physics of the very early universe. You can, you can look at very old stars, see how many of these elements they have from the Big Bang, compare them to your calculations, and learn about how the universe was in the very early minutes, which is really remarkable. So the elements made by these nuclear reactions, these teach us about fundamental properties of the universe. Uh, in a sense, you can learn a little bit about the shape of the universe. You can learn about um, how many so-called baryons you had. There's, there's many interesting things you can learn about this, this, um, uh, the state of the universe a long time ago. But you need to understand the nuclear reactions that went into this process. And there are several interesting problems. For instance, one of them has to do with the amount of lithium that you see early in the universe. One of the more important reactions in this process is one that Cody Parker talked about earlier. It's the fusion between tritium and deuterium. So in the early universe, the helium was made by tritium and deuterium fusing. Now here on Earth in the laboratory, you can use that same exact reaction. Instead, you don't care about the helium that you make, you care about the energy that you get out. This is a very great way to create energy in the lab by a fusion. And this is uh, explored at several places, but one of the main ones is the National Ignition Facility out in, uh, out in California. And again, they're doing the same exact reaction that you, that you care about for the Big Bang, but instead for energy generation. So if we can study this tritium-deuterium fusion, we can learn about the early universe, and we can learn about next generation energy production, which is really remarkable. And so you heard a bit about this from Cody earlier. She did a measurement at the Edwards lab where they, they looked at the ratio when you fuse tritium to deuterium, how often do you emit a gamma ray versus how often do you emit a neutron? And she was able to add to the body of uh, literature there, and there's still a lot of open questions, of course, but uh, nonetheless, this reaction really helps us learn about both astrophysics and applications. Uh, and then the, the final connection that I want to draw out here is that it turns out astrophysical neutron sources, these are related to nuclear reactor neutron sinks. So what I mean by that is that in stellar environments, many of the elements are made via these neutron capture reactions. And the neutrons have to come from somewhere. And one very common um, mechanism is this carbon-13 alpha N. So you take a helium nucleus, you fuse it with carbon, and a neutron is produced. And these neutrons are then what are used to synthesize many of the heavy elements. Now, if you look at this reaction in the mirror and you flip it, here instead you have oxygen-16 being basically busted apart by a neutron and emitting a helium and a carbon-13. So it's just the inverse of this process. And this reaction is important to understand the so-called neutron economy of nuclear reactors. In a nuclear reactor, it is very important that for every neutron you put in, you get about one out, okay? You, you want it to be very close to one, and that's how the reactor uh, sustains itself. A neutron induces fission, um, you can get energy from the fission, and you don't want a lot of extra neutrons because then it runs away, and that's not a reactor anymore. You call that thing a bomb. So what you want to do is if you can understand the carbon-13 alpha N reaction, you can not only learn about how elements were made in stars, but you can also learn about processes that are of interest for you know, nuclear applications on Earth. And this fantastic work was done by Kristen Brandenburg. You heard about this a little bit before. She designed, built, and commissioned this detector called heebie-jeebie with, of course, a lot of help from uh, Tom Massey played a critical role. The machine shop was extremely important with this. And she made this, this wonderful detector heebie-jeebie. So what you do is you use the accelerator to produce a beam of helium or alpha particles. You send that into your target that is located inside this big hunk of plastic that we call heebie-jeebie. The neutrons basically rattle around, they slow down in the plastic, and eventually they're, they're collected by these counters here, these, these gas-filled detectors. And so you count how many beam particles came in by collecting their charge, you count how many neutrons came out, and that's more or less all there is to it, that plus, you know, several years of work. <laughs> and it's easy for me. I just asked Kristen to do it. 
Uh, so that plus several years of work, and you can get out this thing called the cross-section. What is the probability of this reaction happening? And there was a really amazing finding from Kristen's work. When you look at this reaction cross-section as a function of the energy of the alpha particle that you send into the target, the previous results, there were some questions about whether or not they were correct, and the previous results are, are quite wrong. This reaction is far, far weaker than previously found in nuclear experiments. And incredibly, though, it, it actually agrees quite well with theoretical predictions. And so it's, in a sense, we've kind of resolved a little bit of a mystery here, and that's something that Kristen is uh, feverishly working on finishing um, uh, as, she, as she completes her PhD. So what are the key takeaways from these lessons on, on nuclear physics? To study the nucleus, it really helps to crack it apart. You can't just sit there and look at it from afar. You need a facility like the Edwards Accelerator Lab to blast this thing apart. And we have these several beam lines here, and each of these are basically uh, tailored to do a certain kind of cracking. And it's, uh, what makes the Edwards Lab so special is that we have this versatile array of tools, and we're continuing to develop them all the time, as you can see with Kristen's new detector, Joseph's new setup. Um, and that's really what's allowed the Edwards Lab to thrive, is that we've been able to have this diverse set of tools and, and keep making new ones all the time. And as, as important as that is you need a lot of people to do the cracking, <laughs> okay? So the list that you're looking at here, this is every single experimental nuclear physics PhD from low energy experiment from the time that the accelerator lab began uh, to today, including several of the, the current PhD students here. And of this list, around three dozen directly, their thesis was directly pinned on doing a measurement at the Edwards Accelerator Lab. And many more contributed to the experiments over the years. And you know, all of them were essential to contributing to the intellectual environment at the Edwards Lab. So these, these are really the people that made it happen. Uh, of course, it couldn't have been done without the excellent faculty, especially the early uh, hard work and, and really visionary work of Roger Finley. Um, uh, Ray Lane and Jack Rappaport, of course. And, you know, missing from this list, though, are other people that I want to recognize that we could not have done this without. So research faculty, Tom Massey, Alexander Voinov, have been critical to getting this research done. And they, especially the work of the past 20 years, it really could not have been done without them. And there's been a lot of great technical support. Don Carter, we've heard his name over and over again for good reason. He is really a, a linchpin of the lab. Uh, other great engineering staff, Devin Jacobs, Greg LeBlanc. I never got the privilege of working with Dave Sturboys and John O'Donnell, but I hear their names on a weekly basis, so I know what they've, they've meant to the lab. And then the machine shop, um, you know, they have been critical to making all this happen. So Doug Schaefer and Mike Myers are the current denizens of the machine shop, but there have been many before them that we couldn't have done all this without. And of course, the, there's been many others providing support along the way. Julie Gucci, who's hiding in the back, has really been uh, essential support staff and especially for making this meeting happen. So we thank uh, her as well for that, that help. So uh, thank you for your attention and here's to 50 more years of cracking the nucleus apart. Thanks. <laughs> yes. I will put you in charge of the committee. You can be the chair of the committee to make that happen. I came out when I was here. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think everyone here knows me. I'm Joe Shields. I'm part of the Physics and Astronomy Department. And it's a great pleasure for me to provide some closing remarks for this, uh, for this conference. Um, I've really enjoyed participating in this meeting and have this opportunity to revisit the remarkable history of scientific accomplishment at the Edwards Accelerator Lab. And so as, as, as you know, I wear several hats as a participant here, first as a faculty member working in astronomy and astrophysics. And from that vantage point, I really appreciate the, the astrophysics connection. We just heard some of that from, from Zach. 
uh, for some of the important work that's connect, conducted at the lab. And I also appreciate the connection this work provides between our astronomy and nuclear physics groups. It's been an important element in the academic culture and intellectual cohesion of our department. Second, as a former chair of the physics and astronomy department, I was in that role for six years, I'm really proud of the lab's record of success throughout the past five decades, and I'm pleased I could provide at least some small level of support for that. And I have to say, Cody's talk reminded me of, of how I spent a lot of my time as chair, and David Ingram will sympathize, uh, lots of facilities issues. We saw, you know, leaking leaks on walls in the, the building, and yeah, the process chillers and roof leaks and stuff like that. So uh, I did what I could to try to address some of those things. So third, uh, I'm currently Vice President for Research and Creative Activity and Dean of the Graduate College. And from that vantage point, I regard the Edwards, Edwards Accelerator Lab, along with INPP, as a model for creating a robust research group at Ohio University that's demonstrated success in both producing knowledge and launching the tremendous number of students on successful careers. And we saw that amazing list that Jack, Zach just put up on the screen. So I would say it's a model I would love to see replicated in other parts of the university in the future. So while the anniversary we celebrate is linked to the physical manifestation of the Edwards Lab, one thing we've heard repeatedly at this conference um, is the critical role of the people associated with the lab in achieving the success we've heard about and enabling the lab to continue as a vibrant enterprise after five decades. So it's, it's really stating the obvious to say that the people have been foundational to making the whole thing happen. And, and that was recognized early on with the lab and the activity that led up to its creation. And so we know in the, in the early 1960s, the physics department had a newly launched PhD program and was adding faculty including a group working in nuclear physics. And of course, Roger Finley was integral to starting the whole enterprise and laying the groundwork that ultimately resulted in the AEC grant for the accelerator. But in the 1960s, Roger was still a relatively early career scientist and there was a sense that having some additional established talent would be helpful. And we've, we've heard the story about that. The department still has a certain amount of records from that era preserved on paper, that's, that's one of the benefits in the pre-internet era, you can actually still look, find information about what happened, uh, makes historical research possible. And I had spent some time rooting around in the chair's office in some of those records and found a document that illustrates this recognition about the centrality of people to making the enterprise go. So in those early days, um, a conversation had already been initiated with Ray Lane about moving from Argonne National Lab to take a faculty position here. However, the dean or other members of the upper administration were evidently raising questions as to whether spending the money on such a hire was warranted when we didn't know if we would land the funding for an accelerator. So the, the document that I found uh, there, it's a rather remarkable memo dated December 1st, 1965 from the physics, the chair of the physics department, Charlie Randall, to the arts and sciences dean, George Clare, emphasizing that Ray Lane was actually the key to enabling us to secure the AEC grant. Randall starts by saying, quote, it is unfortunate that the Van de Graaff and federal funds have clouded the question of Ray Lane's appointment, unquote. He then lays out several aspects of why Lane's appointment was important. Now, an ironic aspect of this dialogue is that Life Magazine, the famous Life Magazine, which was very high visibility publication in that era with photo, photojournalism spreads and widely read and across the country, Life Magazine, had published earlier the same year, January 1965, an astonishing 16-page spread on Ohio University focusing on President Vern Alden's efforts during a phase when the institution was undergoing dramatic growth. You can find this on the internet. 
in that article, Alden talks at length about how the university is out shopping for talent and eager to recruit big names. So Charlie Randall, in his memo to the dean, points out the disconnect, questioning whether we should be hiring Ray Lane. At the same time, Life Magazine is quoting Vern Alden, and we're out hunting for you know, the big guns. And he goes on to say, quote, as long as the Van de Graaff issue has been raised, I should comment on it. One, the AEC doesn't take kindly to any semblance of pressuring. Two, we must first get the man, then the machine. These are underlined. Um, having the man will make the machine grant more likely. Investing a few thousand in salary now will increase our chances for $500,000 immediately. Three, rejection of the machine for lack of the man will be a serious blow to our present nuclear physics program, unquote. So fortunately, we know that Ohio University did in the end get the man, Ray Lane, and subsequently also got the machine. But through the ensuing 50 years, we've been very fortunate to have remarkable contributions from many other men and women while also upgrading the machine so that it continues to do new and important work. The Edwards Accelerator Lab is testimony to how a targeted investment by the university with continuing support and talent can have a huge payoff over multiple decades. So it's my pleasure to conclude this event. And before we depart, I want to express some thanks to a number of people who made this happen. Daniel Phillips, who's up wandering around as a key organizer. Carl Bruni, Zach Meisel, Julie Getchy, thank you, Julie. Our videographer, Kevin Price, don't forget him. He's fantastic. And, uh, I, and we've also had a very important uh, sponsor for this event, which is the Institute for Nuclear and Particle Physics. And I would act to ask the IMPP director, Dr. Julie Roche, to come forward, please. Here a small token of thanks and esteem for IMPP sponsorship and your leadership of that endeavor. So thank you very much and congratulations on a great conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was uh, not surprised but very impressed by all the work that you do at the accelerator. Congratulations to all of you. And I just want to say that I'm 50 this week. So this is what a 50-year human looked like. And you're welcome to compare to a 50-year lab and uh, <laughs> make your own conclusions. Congratulations for 50 years of great physics. Thank you. Thank Joe for these great closing remarks, and I want to thank all of you for coming and for your contributions to the science of the lab over the last 50 years. I want to add my thanks to Joe's for Julie Goetje for all her work. Let's give Julie a round of applause. And I want to thank all the lab directors for their leadership of the facility over the, the ones uh, past and current. So I, Steve, David Ingram, Carl, and Zach, I think those are the only, I don't think there are any others here, right? But those, so we should thank them. <laughs> and with that, I will close the. Absolutely, yes. I said, so especially the people who traveled here uh, under trying circumstances, we really appreciate you coming back and we hope that you get to uh, enjoy your time in Athens and we always are happy to see 
uh, the graduates from Ohio University come back and come to visit us. So with that, I will close the meeting and uh, wish you all a safe journey home, no matter how far it may be. All right, thanks very much.